My name is Kelly DeMarcus, and I'm counsel in the Privacy and Data Security Group at the Venable Law Firm here in Washington, D.C. I'm delighted to be moderating this afternoon's panel titled The Collapse of the EU Safe um, Our topic is one that certainly has been heavily discussed even in the session this morning. Since the October 6th CCJ decision in the U.S. EU Safe Harbor, um, the thousands of U.S. companies who have relied on the program to engage in lawful transfers of personal information um, from Europe to the United States have been thrown into some degree of uncertainty. I'd hope we would be discussing Safe Harbor 2.0 um, with regulators on both sides of the, the Atlantic still saying there is a chance it will come before the end of this month. Um, even Commissioner McSweeney's remarks this morning, she called herself an optimist uh, about a Safe Harbor 2.0 coming next week. Um, but to get an update to start on where the process is, um, we're delighted that we were joined by Justin and Tony Pillay, who as of today, as the title counselor to the secretary with the delegated duties of undersecretary of economic affairs at the Department of Commerce, who of course has been the lead regulator um, in the negotiations with the Europeans on the new safe harbor. Um, he is catching a plane, so we're gonna, play with the format a little bit. He's going to make some initial remarks and then jet out of here and his helicopter to Dulles or however he's getting to Europe. And then we'll introduce the rest of the panel and uh, proceed with the with the, the session. So. Uh, if I oh, gosh. Share with you. <coughs> Absolutely. So, uh, Kelly, thanks very much. And thanks to uh, the State of the Net Conference uh, for having me uh, here today. Um, I'm only going to be able to speak for a few minutes. The weather has managed to make uh, my presentation here even shorter than it was going to be so that I can catch a flight. Uh, but I did want to spend a few minutes uh, talking about where we are in the safe harbor discussions and giving a few minutes of background before our terrific panel that Kelly is leaving, leading, including uh, Andrea Glorioso uh, from the European Commission, uh, uh, who we've worked with uh, for uh, many years at this point. Um, as Kelly mentioned, um, myself and my colleague from the uh, International Trade Admi uh, uh, Administration have been leading a broad interagency group uh, that includes uh, DOJ and the intelligence community and other elements of our government in a discussion with the European Commission uh, for more than two years now. Uh, so uh, we have had a very productive set of communications and negotiations around improving the safe harbor framework and also providing more information about the limitations and the safeguards under which our intelligence community and our national security elements operate. And for many reasons, we have a very strong case to make on both of those elements because our intelligence community and our national security and our law enforcement elements uh, operate under very well-known limitations and safeguards. And so part of this had, has been a, a long dialogue to make sure that we are level set and that we've been able to provide information to the European Commission uh, about the way our intelligence community and national security elements do business. Um, obviously, we then had the Schrems case following several years of discussions that, and, uh, that came out uh, at the beginning of October. Uh, one thing about the case that I think is worth focusing on before I talk about how much we have been focused to make sure that any new safe harbor satisfies that case <coughs> uh, is it's important to focus on what exactly the Schrems decision did. Uh, the Schrems court, the ECJ, in the case actually was quite focused on what the commission said in its decision in 2000 and most of its focus in, its, in the ECJ's discussion is about flaws in the Commission's decision uh, and how those might be fixed in the next adequacy decision. And why is that important? Uh, it's important because two of the main holdings of the Schrems case were that limiting DPA jurisdiction or, or authority in Europe carries with it legal risk if you do it again. And second, that any next, any time the commission enters another safe harbor adequacy decision, it should look not only at the framework with sort of blinders on, but should look at the framework together with US law and international commitments and how they work together 
to provide limitations on the way uh, the intelligence community and national security operate, so that it's a comprehensive <coughs> uh, look at the way U.S. law operates together with Safe Harbor. What was not in the decision, and this is important, is there's no, there's no findings in the ECJ case about U.S. Uh, national security law. There's no findings in the case about the way U.S. Uh, law enforcement works. Uh, there's nothing in the case criticizing U.S. companies for the way they've actually followed the principles. And it's, it's, it's therefore really important that what we are focused on is providing a strong basis for the Commission to make exactly the findings that the ECJ was focused on in the Schrems case. And that's essentially what we've been doing uh, for two years. In terms of process, I thought I'd just focus on two pieces. Uh, one, we've had a, a very productive dialogue with our colleagues in the Commission for some time. And, and we've presented and had dialogue over various versions of offers, but including, just a few weeks ago, a new comprehensive offer that we think is one of our best offers uh, on the subject. Uh, we're also getting to the point where it's really come to be the time to act. We have uh, data protection authorities in Europe who have talked about uh, next steps beginning at the end of January. And we've pre pre presented a, uh, a very strong proposal that reacts to a lot of the issues in the ECJ case and provides a very strong foundation for the Commission to make exactly the findings, as I say, they're, they're caused to make. But as I said, time is not on our side. Uh, it's important that we come to an agreement and that the parties continue to work together. And we're, of course, committed to do what we can within limits to get to, get to a, an agreement. Um, I thought I would just take one more minute because there's an interesting timing issue that's come up uh, that I'm sure, so folks in this room I sort of take as PhDs on the subject. This isn't an introductory uh, 101 course, so you're probably focused on the fact that uh, the Article 29 Working Party announced a January 31st um, sort of kickoff for possible enforcement actions. That's on a Sunday. And, uh, you know, we also know that now that the working party is going to be meeting on February 2nd and that there's going to be um, communications and dialogue within the commission and among the college taking place on February 2nd. So although we can't give guarantees about these things, especially because the working party is represented by independent DPAs, um, our expectation based on those timings is that it's really February 2nd, not January 31st, that will be a consequential date at this point. Um, I have, I think, time only for a question or two before I go, but if there's something I can focus on in terms of uh, the current state of discussions, I'd be happy to, to talk about it. <coughs> Sure, and, and this is one of those things where we're, we always want to be careful about getting into the details in the middle of these kinds of discussions. I will tell you a couple things. One, um, you know, obviously the FTC has been quite active in the area of privacy. They're a world-class organization, and our, uh, our agreement has to recognize the role they play and to respect it. So on both sides, we have enormous respect for the European principles. The United States takes uh, privacy very, very seriously, and we have institutions that take privacy very seriously. And we're focused on various methods that recognize both sides, institutions, and procedures. Um, I will focus on, in, in one way to answer, is that uh, we have spent a lot of time ensuring that um, EU citizens, with respect to um, the safe harbor, have many means to actually pursue legal remedies if there is an issue in the future. I will tell you that on the issue of EU citizens having their rights or they're under the principles somehow not respected by U.S. companies, there's really no history of this. In other words, 
under a safe harbor as it's been operating for 15 years, there were very few referrals, very few, less, you know, basically a handful to the FTC where there were alleged violations. So the actual history of it is a very strong uh, company compliance and uh, there was nothing in the ECJ case that actually focused on that problem. But we are focused on that problem. We have wanted to make sure that EU citizens with their data have multiple avenues to pursue legal remedies, including cost-free um, alternative dispute resolution, using the Department of Commerce to help them resolve issues, and um, obviously for those of you that have sh uh, uh, studied the ECJ case as well, one of the things that was interesting about it is that while it identified issues that needed to be covered in the next adequacy finding, it also made clear that DPAs were now going to be empowered in Europe to actually investigate the uh, safe harbor issues. So in some ways, the, the ECJ case itself provided a very strong method for EU citizens to bring to their own DPAs in Europe complaints so that their DPAs in Europe could follow up on them uh, on that side of the Atlantic. Uh, we obviously have to respect our, our enforcement mechanisms, including the FTC, uh, and we want to be careful about uh, situations that you would subject companies to all of the 44 DPAs in Europe in addition to the FTC. So we have to be thoughtful about these things, but we are very, very focused on making sure that the safe harbor is improved, uh, that we respect both sides, institutions, and laws, that we provide enough information about the way our law enforcement and national security uh, apparatuses operate and all of the limitations and strictures under which they do operate, which, uh, as we know, the ECJ case sets up a standard of essential equivalence. It doesn't set up a standard of identity, right, or absolute, uh, absolute of the same. Right on the on that issue. That's probably the worst phraseology I've ever used. But um, forgive me. It's been a lot of snow over the last couple of days. Um, but we, we're focused on these issues, and we're trying to set up a, a durable, strong framework, um, uh, and one that the uh, EC can really make a new finding on. And with that, I apologize that I have to leave. But thank you very much, and I uh, hope this was helpful. Thank you, Justin. Okay. <laughs> off to go negotiate the final final deal, let's hope. Um, okay, so now let me introduce the panelists for this afternoon's discussion. Um, to my left is Mr. Andrea Glorioso. He's counselor for the G digital economy at the delegation of the European Union to the United States in Washington, D.C. In this role, he acts as the liaison between the EU and U.S. on policy, regulation, and research activities related to the Internet and information and communication technologies. Mr. Glorioso also worked for eight years at the European Commission in Brussels on cybersecurity, personal data protection, cloud computing, and Internet governance. And then to his left is Bijan Mithani, Public Policy and Regulatory Counsel at the Computer and Communications Industry Association. Uh, where he concentrates primarily on privacy and surveillance policy, cybersecurity, and internet governance issues. And then also um, appearing via Skype is uh, Professor Meg Lita Jones, Assistant Professor at Georgetown's Communication, Culture, and Technology Department, where she researches and teaches in the area of technology law and policy. Uh, her research interests cover a wide range of technology policy issues, including comparative privacy law, and the governance of emerging technologies. So we've heard now from the U.S. perspective, but we thought we would open up this afternoon's panel by getting um, the European rebuttal. So Andrea, um, what do, uh, what's your response to Justin? And he's gone, so feel free to <laughs> take him on directly. I'm sure right now Justin is following or streaming, so I have to be careful anyway. <laughs> what I'm going to say, thank you, Kelly. And I, Thanks to all of you for being here. And by the way, I think it's really incumbent to me to thank the organizers for managing to rearrange a conference, this conference, in very difficult conditions. So thanks to Tim and to all the team instead of the net. Um, 
I, I really don't think that what I want to do is a rebuttal because by and large I think that uh, both based on what Justin said uh, and in general the negotiation that we've been having with the US government, uh, we're actually on the same page, quite frankly. And the European Commission has made it very clear on the, I think that uh, immediately on the day of the ruling of the European Court of Justice, which was indeed on October the 6th, uh, which is a day that I will remember for a long time as it has been the start for two or three or four very difficult months, very complex months here at the delegation in the US. The European Commission uh, on that day uh, issued a press release, gave a press conference, and we made it very clear from day one that our objective uh, was to safeguard uh, the flow of personal data between Europe and the US and vice versa, while at the same time, uh, and this has to be very clear, ensuring that the respect of uh, European citizens, ensuring the respect of European citizens' rights, uh, given the new framework uh, or the clearer framework that the court has handed us. Allow me, even though I understand that perhaps a lot of people in this room are very much aware of that, but I think it's nonetheless useful uh, to remind that the European, the Court of Justice of the European Union or European Court of Justice is our top court, is the equivalent Mutatis mutandis, it's a different legal system, but it is the equivalent in practice of the US Supreme Court. So I want people to be very aware that this, as far as we are concerned, is the law of the land. We have no uh, neither possibility nor, quite frankly, desire to bypass what the court has told us. Uh, another thing that I will say, which I think is very important to understand uh, where we stand with the negotiations and what we want to achieve, uh, is that if you take a step back, what we have been discussing with the U.S. since uh, October the 6th uh, is, in fact, uh, th that discussion is a discussion that started way before October the 6th. Because already in October 2013, so more than two years ago by now, the Commission, uh, following the fact, I think we can be very honest about that, following the so-called Snowden revelations and the very deep political impact that those revelations or leaks or whatever you want to call them had on the European public, the European Commission, uh, rather than suspending at that point in time the safe harbor arrangement, uh, which many parties in Europe, many people in Europe wanted us to do, we said, well, no, we think that uh, the safe harbor, the 2000 safe harbor decision has to be improved, has to be strengthened, and we came up with a set of 13 recommendations, which are publicly available. And we have been conducting discussion with the U.S. government uh, since October 2013 on the basis of those 13 recommendations. And I think it's, uh, even though I, it is true, what Justin said is true, that if you actually look at the ruling of the European Court of Justice, most of what the European Court of Justice says uh, is about the European Commission. It's about uh, the Irish Data Protection Authority. It's about the EU legal order. And it's about the 2000 safe harbor decision. Now, as a commission official, I'm, I don't have the habit to comment or criticize uh, on the decision of the European Court of Justice. I will say, though, that another point it's important to remember, we are talking about the 2000 safe harbor decision. It's been 15 years. So in a way, I think it's quite understandable that there were and there are elements of the decision which needed improvement. Uh, and this is what we've been doing with the US. And part of the remarks, part of the reasons why the European Court of Justice struck down uh, declared null and void uh, the 2000 safe harbor decision were in fact issues that the European Commission had already identified uh, in those 13 recommendations. And part of those have already de facto been solved or there is an agreement already with the US government. Um, in terms of where we stand with the negotiations, I'm afraid that I, I can't really get into the details for reasons that you can easily imagine, but also because, quite honestly, uh, these negotiations are literally right now, they're literally happening uh, every single day. There are phone calls or video conferences or in some case face-to-face -face meetings, which is one of those meetings I think Justin is going to every single day. So whatever I tell you today might change tomorrow. don't think there is a lot of um, sense in making that. But the broad contour of what we have been uh, discussing with the US government uh, are known. It's about having a proper redress for European citizens uh, in the US. Uh, and although we fully, and I want to be very clear on that, we have great respect uh, for the US system, the fact that uh, up to now there hasn't been an adequacy finding uh, says nothing about the fact that we recognize that the US system uh, within the confines of 
the U.S. as a nation works well. And we have deep respect for the enforcement powers and enforcement activities of the Federal Trade Commission. On the other hand, much like data protection authorities, the FTC is an independent authority. So for us, the question has been, uh, since you can't, the U.S. government cannot bind the FTC to follow up on any particular complaint by European citizens. In the same way in which, by the way, the European Commission cannot bind the data protection authorities to follow up on complaints, because they are all independent authorities. So the question for us is, can we make sure that in those cases, which might be limited, but as the court pointed out, this is a point of principle. Uh, it's a fundamental right of European citizens to have appropriate judicial redress. I think it's Article 47, if I remember correctly, of our Charter of Fundamental Rights. Uh, we've been discussing with the US, can we make sure that in those limited cases in which there is no possibility for FTC enforcement, uh, the European citizens can have, or intervention by the Department of Commerce or alternative dispute resolution <laughs> systems uh, that European citizens are anyway covered. This is one of the things we've been discussing with the US government. We've also been discussing, uh, uh, and the Department of Commerce uh, leading the interagency group on behalf of the US government, uh, we've also been discussing, can we have uh, as much clarity as possible on the actual safeguards and limitations on access to personal data of European citizens transferred under the safe harbor regime, access by law enforcement authorities and intelligence agencies. I think that is also important because, you know, we, we, we take at face value what the U.S. tells us. The U.S. is our main ally. We are together in NATO and we've been together and we are together on many security issues and rather complex issues across the world. But still, I think it's fair to say that, uh, from my perspective at least, or from our perspective, uh, the, precise, uh, the precise framework under which the federal and state level law enforcement agencies and intelligence agencies can access data is not always clear. And part of this is also because uh, we recognize, and this is a very positive development, that in the past two or three years that there have also been developments in the US, uh, legislative changes, uh, new, uh, new frameworks, executive action, and so on and so forth. So there, we've been asking for more clarity, if at all possible, on what is the actual framework. Um, I think I will... Uh, move towards conclusion and give, you know, hear from industry uh, why we are screwing up everything and why we should all <laughs> get all back home. And we heard a lot of that lately. Um, I want to make one point very clear that throughout our discussion with the U.S. government uh, in the context of the safe harbor discussions, uh, uh, we have not asked uh, for legislative changes in the U.S. We have not done that. Our objective uh, is to arrive at a situation which is satisfactory on both sides. Uh, but quite frankly, is satisfactory from our perspective. It respects the ruling of the European Court of Justice. It abides to the 13 recommendation that we have put forward in 2013. Of course, it's a sovereign decision of the US government whether they want to propose legislative changes, but that has not been the basis for our discussion so far, because uh, call us naive, but we think that there is there is the flexibility to achieve what we want to achieve within the, within the framework, within the legal framework that we currently have uh, in the US. And I think I will shut up now. I don't know if there are questions uh, already at this point in time, but I, I hope we can make this interactive uh, and uh, I'll try to say as much as I can about where we stand with the negotiations. So I haven't got a prepared statement. Um, we were oh, this was not prepared, no. So <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, the Commission and the uh, Department of Commerce are uh, at the top of their games. Um, so we don't actually have much in the way of complaints about the negotiation, about uh, the way things have been handled over the last uh, three months or even two years and three months. Um, we've, we've, in our interactions with the Department of Commerce, with the Commission, uh, industry feels like we, we are getting a lot of information. Um, we are, there is optimism in the most recent uh, round of negotiations. Uh, so my perspective is sort of one of, you know, just like yours outside looking in, but we also have the consequence of being industry uh, sort of being affected by this in the weeds discussion of what's going on in, in the negotiations. Um, so the, con the discussion of what authority DPAs have in Europe, whether there is a sort of referential authority between the DPAs and the commission here, uh, whether uh, there's transparency reporting by companies pursuant to whatever is going on in negotiations right now, um, that all sort of in the end comes down to sort of activity that companies have to prepare for in Europe, in he over here, that can be costly, that can be burdensome um, for large and small companies. And so we're sort of waiting with bated breath. Uh, uncertainty is the best way to sort of characterize uh, where my companies uh, currently sit. Um, over the last three months, they've been sitting on a knife's edge um, because they, they operated in good faith under the 
prior safe harbor agreement that was in existence for 15 years. So those 15 years of sort of good practice with generally little um, grounds for enforcement authority from the commission, as uh, the Department of Commerce and uh, Commissioner McSweeney have mentioned before, um, sort of indicate to us that you know our companies were operating in good faith. Uh, and so over the last three months without a legal basis or with sort of a tenuous legal basis at best, um, the sort of January 31st deadline has loomed uh, pretty ominously. Um, we're actually fairly optimistic based on what we're hearing uh, with our partners in commerce uh, who have been uh, in our office that is also uh, sort of paying attention from Brussels and in Davos over the last couple of weeks um, that the negotiations are going well. Um, the same sorts of points, uh, technical points about the DPA authority, about the sort of in, uh, sharing of information about the surveillance structure in the United States with uh, the EC and stakeholders there. Um, we hear about just as frequently as you do. And I think things are going fairly positively. I think um, even though negotiations agreed, the news is coming out as very positive. Is there any concern um, that this is essentially the start of a, a very long and arduous path? I mean, Safe Harbor 2.0 is going to be subject to challenge in the courts. Um, perhaps binding corporate rules and model clauses also will be opened up. I mean, is, this, is there worry that this starts a period of uncertainty that could go on for, for a decade? Yeah, I think our companies have been preparing for that since October 2013, since the Snowden revelations. Um, there is sort of a, a differential, I think, between smaller and larger companies. Larger companies, uh, to the extent they can, can afford counsel like uh, Venable. Um, smaller companies, less so. There is, uh, I have conversations with member companies that are like, well, you know, we were Safe Harbor certified. Uh, we aren't anymore, but, you know, they'll find some mechanism for us to, to get along with. And, you know, there are some general counsels who are out there like, under the impression that MCCs are going to be just fine for the next two years without any challenge. Um, I'm not outside counsel, but I do my best to advise them to go find someone um, who can disabuse them of that notion. Um, so yeah, there is going to be a period of uncertainty, but I also think that uh, there, there is some reason for optimism, um, at least in the next couple of weeks when it comes to the conclusion of the negotiations. So I guess narrow optimism, wider uh, concern. Can I react to Sure. If I may, uh, sorry, Mag, to, to you know keep you out of the microphone, but um, on this point uh, on uncertainty or certainty, I think it's important that we all uh, try to see this in a pragmatic but realistic way. So first of all, uh, not everybody might be aware of the fact that even when we get, and I don't want to scare anybody, but again, I think it's important we all understand the procedure here. When we will get, and I say when, not if, when we will get to an agreement with the U.S. Uh, fairly soon, hopefully, uh, in any case, the Commission, uh, the European Commission, uh, which I represent here, will need to make a proposal, that proposal, internal proposal. That proposal will have to be approved uh, or not rejected uh, um, by a qualified majority of member states. We will have to ask uh, for the non-binding opinion of the Article 29 Working Party, for the non-binding opinion of the European Data Protection Supervisor, and for the non-binding opinion of the European Parliament. Uh, now, anybody who has been working on politics will be very much aware that we are not going on top of that. Uh, we are very much aware because uh, some uh, civil liberties NGOs have been so kind as to tell us very clearly that they're already preparing for a new challenge uh, to whatever will come out of these negotiations, which is fully within their rights, uh, to be absolutely clear. But the bottom line is that both from a political and legal point of view, from our side, we certainly want to make sure that we have uh, a, a framework uh, that is very, very solid and that we resist uh, any kind of challenge, or I mean, as much as possible, any kind of challenge. That's the first thing that people have to be aware of. I don't think it's in anybody's interest that we rush these discussions and then we come up with something that is going to be struck down in three, four, five, or six months. Um, I don't think it's good for anybody, not for business, not for us, not for the US government, uh, not for anyone. Um, the other thing that I will mention in terms of uh, the other forms, because again, in the discussion, the other, the other ways, the other means to transfer personal data from Europe, from the European Union to third countries and the US in this specific case, that yes, as has been mentioned, that there are other forms of doing that, there are other ways of doing that, whether it's through model control clauses, binding corporate rules, the consent of the data subject, uh, the performance of the contract, uh, all of these tools to transfer personal data are maintained, uh, and it is the official position of the European Commission, which we express in a communication, uh, so in a official policy positions of November 2015, and I'm happy to give you 
details, uh, because in that communication, the European Commission clearly states uh, we believe uh, that these alternative forms uh, of uh, transferring personal data remain valid. I get it that some people disagree with that. It's within their right to disagree, but that is the position of the European Commission. And last but not least, uh, I think what we're seeing now, trying to look at the broader picture, uh, you know, in life, as any lawyer will tell you, uh, you know, economists and lawyers and political scientists like me uh, will answer to any question, it depends. Uh, and you have no certainty in life, and anything can be challenged in court. What I think we're seeing now is that there is a lot more attention, both from a political and from an economic and from a cultural and societal point of view, to issues such as privacy and personal data protection, which until very recently, basically nobody cared about. Let's be very clear about that. I've been working on privacy for 15 years at least. And uh, I mean, it's fascinating to me to see how much this has become important in the past two or three years. That was not the case. It was a very restricted circle. <laughs> very few people who actually were interested. So I don't find it surprising that now there is a lot more pressure on companies and on lawyers and on courts uh, to decide on matters uh, because this has become a matter of uh, much broader, whether we like it or not, it has become a matter of much broader political and cultural and societal significance. So people who hope that simply because the, U the EU and the US agree on uh, this new safe harbor, then there, will, there won't ever be <laughs> any other challenges are mistaken. And people better get prepared for that uh, because, as I said, whether we like it or not, this has become very, very important. And I hope I'm not you know, putting down smooth, putting anyone smooth down, <laughs> but this is the reality in which we have to work on. And it's important we manage the expectations of everybody properly, especially in the long term. Mm -hmm. Hi, Meg. Can you, if you can hear us, do you have any reaction to what's been said so far? Oh yeah, that's um, that's a great question. Just to react to things, uh, I first want to apologize for not being able to get all the way down to the museum. I'm in the waddle stage of pregnancy, um, but I see that my uh, galaxy picture from Battlestar Galactica is being shown. So <laughs> at least there's a benefit. Um, yeah. I actually want to, if it's okay, I'd like to react to something that was really interesting from uh, what Max Rem said earlier. Um, he really emphasized that um, that he was just one person, um, you know, and that if someone else wanted to to step in um, or give him a hundred thousand um, dollars, that he would continue to to fight the good fight and and the the good fight. He he sees the good fight being this stance on. Um, surveillance practices around the world, um, and I think that that is that is a particularly interesting aspect of this conversation. Is that um, there's just been a few people involved in kind of tumbling safe harbor and a few other things that were the status quo of the internet that we're all functioning around for a long time. And I don't envy the people that are sitting at the table uh, trying to figure out a framework in light of the fact that the big questions are still on the table. We haven't, no one's figured out what to do with surveillance versus privacy. Um, no one's figured out how we weigh those as the world keeps changing, how we, um, how we get these numerous cultures to, to work together to come to some type of functioning framework so that we can send data data back and forth. But also, in addition to that, accounting for the individual efforts um, that exist and that float around and come in through the court cases at various speeds uh, is also, I think, incredibly challenging. Um, the, the other thing that I thought was interesting that was said was that the U.S. U.S. companies have no history of invading anyone's privacy um, or EU citizens' privacy. Is uh, privacy? I, I don't. I don't think that European Union citizens feel as though their privacy um, has been respected. I'm not sure that Americans feel like their privacy has been respected, and that's another big, another big question. But I don't think that it's necessary to to frame. The issue as well, we were doing fine for a while, and and then we ran into this hurdle. Um, I don't, I don't think that many people would would agree with that. Um, we were s sort of scooting along there for a while <laughs> in an okay fashion, uh, but uh, safe harbor seemed to be 
seemed to have a, a lifespan that was coming to its natural end around this time anyways. And so uh, I think that it's it's perfect timing. I think 20 years uh, after the directive is a perfect time to, to revisit this anyways. I don't think that, the, that these uh, people at the table have been forced into this. I think that it's it's nice timing, but they're not going to be able to answer these huge questions. Their their goal is to come up with this framework to provide certainty, um, which is really challenging because the case itself reads as though they have to figure out these huge questions first. Thanks for that. Um, so Meg raises the point that Europeans and maybe even Americans uh, might not feel that industry is adequately protecting their privacy. At the same time, the remarks from Commissioner McSweeney and Justin as well said, you know, most U.S. companies have operated in good faith and in compliance with the safe harbor principles. So is a revised set of safe harbor principles enough? Or is there a fundamental disconnect between what companies say they're doing with personal information um, and... Uh, what what's actually happening with it? I mean, to the extent that there is a disconnect between what companies, individual companies, are saying with what they're doing with information and what actually happens with it, I think that's a question for the commission to answer um, under their Section Five authority. They have deceptive practices authority, and they the federal very, commission, the federal the federal, federal, federal trade commission, commission, not not the EC, uh, and they uh, fairly regularly choose to. Uh, uh, enforce that, uh, use that authority on my member companies on a fairly regular basis. So I don't think there's a, a question about uh, whether there's a there's a commission, uh, an FTC bite. Um, they have the bark, they have the bite, and they choose to use it on a regular basis. So if there is a concern, I think, or about that disconnect, I think you know there should be petitions to the FTC for broader enforcement authority, perhaps uh, from the FTC to Congress, which I think they've sought, um, and if to sort of address that disconnect, I guess, domestically. Internationally, that's another question for governments to address with governments, and I think that's happening a little bit uh, at the negotiating table for the safe harbor. Um, if I may, to react, react to the point that uh, Meg raised, if I understood it correctly. Uh, right now, uh, not necessarily me. I mean, I, I, I am involved in the safe harbor discussion, but I don't always sit at the table of negotiation. I don't work on it 24-7, thanks God. Other colleagues have to do it. Uh, but right now, there is obviously a focus on solving the most immediate issue, which is, again, as we all know, the fact that the Court of Justice annulled this particular framework for transferring personal data. And we have been told in no certain terms uh, by both the US and European industry that that is the immediate concern that needs to be addressed. And that is also what the Commission said we would address, the European Commission said we would address. So that's an immediate concern. But that doesn't mean that we are unaware of the fact uh, that there is a broader discussion, there is a broader issue to be addressed here, which is uh, what people call the balance. I'm not sure I would call it balance between privacy and security. I, you know, when you say balance, it somehow seems like it. by necessary, you need to have less of one in order to have more of the other. And I'm not convinced that that is necessarily the case. But in any case, there is a broader societal discussion to be had on what we as a society or as societies in Europe in the US. Uh, we want, uh, in terms of uh, activities of our intelligence services, of our law enforcement apparatus, uh, and so on and so forth. That's a conversation which uh, needs to happen. And I'm expressing personal views in this moment. That's a conversation that needs to happen. I think that many parties are, uh, are contributing to that conversation already. Uh, not all of you will know that the Fundamental Rights Agency, which is an independent agency of the European Union, it's based in, uh, in Vienna, uh, has recently uh, published a report, so it's an official report of that agency, on the intelligence and surveillance practices of the 28 member states. So I want to be clear, it's not like we ignore that there is a discussion, a debate to be had within the European Union as well. Similar debates have been ongoing for some time now in the U.S. Uh, through various means, whether by NGOs, by branches of the government, and so on and so forth. But ultimately, this is not uh, an issue that we can solve in the context. We will not find, uh, uh, in my view, a satisfactory solution to this conversation by the 21st of January or the 2nd of February or whatever Monday it might be. I don't have my calendar in front of me. Uh, so, yes, it's a conversation we need to have, but as a bureaucrat, as a commission official, I try to prioritize <laughs> the problems that I need to solve. And right now, we have an urgent issue to address. Uh, it's not to discount the importance of the other issue, but we can't, uh, and I'm not convinced by the way that the European Commission or the Department of Commerce should be the one speaking on behalf of society on this broader issue of the balance uh, on, on how much surveillance we want to have. I managed to have Meg. No. 
drop alpha. That's a very cool avatar, by the way. So I want that as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Judicial Redress Act. So, Andrea, you said that um, we have not been asked for legislative changes, we the United States, and that's not been the basis for the discussion. Um, true. But there has been a lot of attention paid to the Judicial Redress Act and certainly statements from stakeholders in Europe saying things like it's necessary for Safe Harbor 2.0. Um, after the markup was postponed again last week, again, a statement came out that said, you know, this could push back the whole negotiation. Um, how important is the Judicial Redress Act and why is it so important to these discussions? Uh, so let me get a bit technical here. The Judicial Redress Act, uh, uh, and we have been very clear on that, is necessary in order for another agreement, the umbrella agreement for exchange of personal data for law enforcement purposes between the European Union, the US, and vice versa, to be approved or ratified by the European Parliament, we, which is a necessity. It's not a necessity for the safe harbor because, uh, again, I don't want to become too technical, but safe harbor is not an international agreement. It's a unilateral decision by the European Commission approved by the member states. The umbrella agreement for the exchange of personal data for law enforcement purposes is, you know, for all practical purposes, an international agreement. It has to be ratified by our parliament, uh, and our parliament has made it very clear that it will do so only if there are, if in the context of that exchange of personal data, again, for law enforcement purposes, there is a possibility for judicial redress for European citizens. And this is why, in cooperation with uh, this administration, with Congress, uh, we have uh, express the wish uh, that something like the Judiciary Redress Act would see the light. Now, is the Judiciary Redress Act uh, technically necessary for the conclusion of the safe harbor negotiations? Uh, I don't believe so. That's not the information I have so far. Would it hurt <laughs> if we had the Judiciary Redress Act in place? Uh, no, it certainly wouldn't. Uh, would it send uh, a difficult political signal if on the eve uh, of trying to conclude on safe harbor the Judiciary Redress Act uh, were to be postponed again? Well, after some years uh, in European uh, working around European politics, it wouldn't necessarily send the right signal, let's put it this way. But we have never, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure I know which statement you refer to, this statement that you mentioned, I don't know which statement you refer to, but as far as I'm aware during the negotiation, we never subjected uh, the approval of the Judiciary Dress Act. Uh, we never subjected the uh, conclusion of the Safe Harbor Talks to the approval of the Judiciary Dress Act. We did in the case of the Umbrella Agreement, which again is a separate agreement for the exchange of personal data for law enforcement purposes. I think there was a statement uh, to that effect from Parliament, uh, some groups in Parliament at the end of last week when the market was I can't from, speak for the European Parliament, so you will have to, to ask them. Um, as to the Redress Act, I think we're con we are consistent with the Commission. We think it's, uh, from an industry perspective, we've been supportive of it from since prior to the Safe Harbor decision in October. Um, we think that, you know, from a sort of wider atmospheric political basis, um, it isn't a sort of another act of good faith uh, by our government, by our ind and our industry from supporting that to show that you know we have trustworthy practices here with respect to Europeans' data. Um, and in this context, it is limited to sort of law enforcement data transfers under um, the the umbrella agreement that uh, Andrea described. But I think it is a sort of a, a brick in that wall to sort of rebuild the trust uh, across the Atlantic from internet users' perspective, not so much from the political angle. Mm -hmm. Thank you, but questions to you? Oh. Thank you all. Steve Del with NetChoice. Andrea, you asked about the balance between security and privacy, and the answer is your answer. It depends. It, it depends on the proximity and uh, recency of the latest terrorist attack, which is, which is rapidly what is emerging on your continent now. So you predicted there may be additional court challenges of the new safe harbor agreement. And I would ask you that if one were brought six months from today, would the court look at the equivalence of protections in Europe versus protections in the US? And would it look at it under the current security and surveillance practices of European governments and US governments? In other words, it won't look back to 2000, or it won't even look back to 2015, but contemporarily in a post-Paris world, that equivalence question could come out very differently in a subsequent challenge to Safe Harbor 2.0, given the surveillance practices of European governments today? Uh, I'm not sure there's a question there, Steve, but um, 
First of all, the most dangerous thing that any commission official or any governmental official for that matter can do is try to predict what the court will or will not say. And I will certainly not do that with our top court. So if a well, case I was will asking come if they're allowed to look at the contemporary yes. situation as opposed to historical. Uh, that, uh, that very much depends. Okay, now I get the question. Sorry, Steve. I, I really did not see a question there. Now I, I get what the question is. Uh, as far as I know, yes. But that very much depends on the kind of questions that are asked to the court. In the particular procedure that, again, sorry to be technical, but I think it's important to keep in mind that in the court procedure that ultimately led to the annulment of the safe harbor decision, the European Court of Justice was asked uh, certain questions. Uh, and uh, in this particular procedure, which is a, a request for a preliminary ruling, if you're interested, it's a way in which the European Court of Justice is asked uh, by a national high court uh, or one of our 28 member states how it should interpret, you know, how the national high court should interpret European Union law. And that was the question that in the Schrems case was asked uh, to the court. Uh, if the European Court of Justice asks different questions, it will probably give different answers. And I, uh, again, I don't want to speak with the court, and quite frankly, I cannot speak for the court. Uh, but I would, I, I could not, I, I don't see why the court could not assess the specific security situation on the basis of the information that is provided by the government. And there again, allow me to make a, another point, that in the particular procedure that was followed in the Schramm case, again, a request for a preliminary ruling, uh, the European Court of Justice, uh, it's not that it had the choice, was not allowed to seek facts. It had to rely on the facts that were provided by the, to the court uh, by the referring court, which in this case was the Irish High Court. There are other procedures in our system in which the European Court of Justice can actually seek facts. So again, uh, you know, a court decides on the basis of the docket, so to speak, on what is being presented to it. Uh, and it's the responsibility of the parties, which are either parties to the case or have, are not parties, but entities which have an interest in the outcome to the case, to present the proper information. And personally, I believe that in the Schrems case, not all the parties that now claim uh, they have uh, an incredible high stake in the safe harbor, I don't think that all those parties took the, uh, you know, took the time to present all the information that they should have presented to the Irish courts so that that information would reach the European Court of Justice. I hope I'm not being too Byzantine, but there are limits to what I can say as a commission official, so I hope that's enough. Okay. Um, one thing that I think, if I, I'll pivot a little bit, one thing that's emerged um, from some of the morning remarks as well is this difference between small companies and large companies. And, um, Mr. Schramm's remarks also touched on something interesting, that there were a large number of companies under the safe harbor that really aren't subject to FISA at all. Um, is there any way forward maybe to make a distinction between, we're always talking about Google and Facebook, but there are also certainly a lot of small companies who are just moving marketing data or something uh, very simple. Um, any sort of suggestions or help for that segment of the industry? In, in in Max's remarks, uh, th there was sort of like, I guess, a, a bit of confusion, I think, from my perspective about whether a company in the United States that takes, uh, that is certifies under the safe harbor is subject to jurisdiction under FISA. Um, it isn't, you know, either or. I mean, if you're a company in the United States and you transfer data from abroad um, and you're subject of the, I mean, and some of that information is subject to the interest of the intelligence community, you are as a U.S. company subject to the jurisdiction of FISA. There isn't like a, you aren't a FISA company. You, I mean, if you are on the PRISM slides that were leaked by Snowden, you're subject to certain requirements. And if you're not on those slides, you're subject to different requirements. Um, I, I don't think that distinction really exists. Um, and so if there's a carve out perhaps in practice, there, you know, it turns out that, re that retail companies don't tend to be subject to FISA requests. They should be subject to sort of different safe harbor requirements than other country companies. I don't think that in practice that's going to end up being something that's feasible to sort of make that sort of distinction. Uh, I, I, can't, I mean, my colleague is much more, uh, is better prepared to talk about companies and what their interests are. But uh, allow me to point out one thing, and I know this might be unpopular, and we are very conscious of the economic impact of the Schrems decision of the importance of safe harbor. And I myself work in the private sector for many years before joining the commission. So all of this is not new to me. And we want to make sure that companies, both well, 
quite frankly, especially European companies, but also American companies on a, on a fair level can operate properly. But let us not forget that, again, uh, the main reason why the court struck down uh, the 2000 Safe Harbor decision were three articles uh, in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union that has very little to do with whether life will become more or less difficult for companies uh, with the new Safe Harbor framework. You know, you, you might be happy or unhappy about that, but that's the legal reality in which we are, we are living. So. I want to be extremely clear, we are not, we have been very careful throughout the negotiation to make sure that whatever we come up with will not unduly penalize small companies or even large companies for that matter. I think large companies can handle a, you know, post safe post Schrems world uh, without too many problems. They have the money and the lawyers to do that. Small companies have a more difficult life. So we've been very careful. We're trying to be very careful. But ultimately, when, and I personally think it's a when, it's not an if, when we will find ourselves again in front of the European Court of Justice uh, to justify, to argue for the new safe harbor framework, whatever it will be called, the court will not ask, uh, so has this been good or will not only ask, has this been good for business? It will ask, is this compatible with Article 7, 8, 46, and whatever else of the Charter? And this is something we need to be very much aware of. I think there's a question. Alan Rawl, Sidley Austin. Uh, first a clarification and then a question. I think that there is one distinction under FISA that may be relevant, which is under the 702 program. Prism that was the subject of particular concern to Mr. Schrems in Ireland. Uh, that applies to electronic communications sure. providers. So companies that are not in that business uh, wouldn't necessarily, it wouldn't be relevant to them. They might be subject, but they wouldn't be relevant. Um, with regard to uh, uh, Article 7 and 8 for privacy and data protection that Mr. Glorioso just mentioned, um, would you imagine that in future legal rulings or would the Commission take into account the uh, obligation to, to balance the interests of uh, privacy and data protection, which while fundamental rights are not absolute, of course, and uh, required to be balanced with other important interests, including security of individuals, including the right to conduct a business, uh, and so on, and also balanced uh, with respect to the international trade obligations of the European Union uh, to grant um, most favored nation and national treatment uh, status to the United States, which appears uh, perhaps to uh, not be receiving the benefit of the same margin of discretion that the uh, that Europe grants its own member states with regard to surveillance and other countries with respect to which the EU has found adequacy that uh, uh, whose legal regimes also uh, have surveillance and national security exemptions. Thank you. Um, thank you, Alan. That's a most interesting question. I don't think I will be able to answer it in, uh, in this panel. We'll have a beer or something and we'll go over it. And we're speaking hypothetically, I imagine. So hypothetically speaking, uh, uh, the obligation to balance, as you point out, uh, both in the Charter and in general under EU law, there is always a balancing test to be made. Article 7 and 8 on the protection of privacy and personal data have to be balanced uh, against other fundamental rights that are present in the Charter. Now, of course, if the Commission is a largish entity, it's not as large as some think when they try to cut our budget, but it's still a largish entity. And uh, um, if you talk to people who have been within the Commission working on privacy for 10 years of their life, they will have a certain perspective on what is more or less important. If you talk to people who have been working on support to small and medium enterprises, they will have a different perspective. That's a natural part of life, which is why all our legislative proposals and also the non-legislative proposals always go through what here in the U.S. would be called an interagency process, so that different voices can be heard, and then people get together in a room, and we throw chairs at each other, and then at the end, we come up with something that hopefully makes sense in a balance way. The, from my perspective, the most interesting part of your question concerns the international trade obligations that you mentioned and the most favorable nation principle. Uh, there we'll, uh, uh, and here we're really going to rather complex stuff, and I'm speaking completely hypothetically, but A, uh, under international, uh, international trade law, under WTO regime, uh, as you know better than me, and specifically under GATS, the General Agreement uh, on Trading Services, there is a general uh, exception, uh, exemption in that agreement for all parties to that agreement <coughs> for privacy matters, just as there is for national security matters. So in general, I think that I, I obviously as a commission official, uh, I would not say that we have violated in any way or form, neither the letter nor the spirit of international trade law in the way in which we implement our privacy regulations towards third countries. 
On top of that, as you know, we, since privacy and personal data protection are for us uh, fundamental rights, I'm not saying they're not for the US, I'm simply describing how they are seen in the EU law and policy context, uh, we don't uh, do trade deals on them. And uh, it's very clear in TTIP, for example, as you'll know, in the Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership, the EU-US trade agreement that we are working on, our mandate, the European Commission mandate, uh, the European Commission negotiates on behalf of the European Union in trade negotiation, and our mandate specifically excludes privacy matters from uh, uh, from TTIP. And uh, you can find very similar exact carve-outs from the mandates about the trade discussions. Because since privacy and personal data protection are fundamental rights, uh, we don't believe that you can actually have economic deals, commercial deals out of that. What that means in terms of the most favored nation uh, uh, principles and others, uh, for that I think I will have first to do my homework and restudy what I studied about international trade law and then we will need to have a bit more time to discuss that. And I hope that kind of answers your point, which I think is a very interesting one, by the way. Okay, looks like we have just about five minutes. Are there, make sure we have time for any other questions, thoughts, comments? Meg's back, back with us if she has anything she'd like to say as well. Meg, any comments or thoughts? No, I just, uh, just thinking about what, uh, Andrea just said, Andrea always talks too fast for me, um, but <laughs> I, I think that when we talk about balance, this is a huge, much more important in European law and balance and priorities, um, but I think what balance actually looks like in this area is a set of balanced decisions where in those decisions you've had to make a bunch of hard choices. Um, and right now it feels like the hard choices are that companies can have data um, and they can't, the companies, U.S. companies can't have data unless the U.S. government is going to stay out of it. Um, and the, this, this, these big questions about the balkanization and the future of the internet, those I think are the series of choices that we make to avoid the, this balkanization of the internet. But um, the really hard questions I think today are, is not that we need to make a balanced decision, that this needs to look balanced today, um, but that over the next five to ten years that this needs to look like a balanced regime between our two regions. Thank you. Thanks, Meg. Um, any, any predictions? I feel like I should sell those squares with the dates. Safe Harbor 2.0, Bijan, what's your guess? I'm not in any office pools on this. Um, <laughs> you don't have to participate. <laughs> no. um, we're optimistic uh, based on sort of the things that Justin has said and the things that Ted has sort of largely laid out for us, uh, similar to what uh, the Secretary of Commerce said last week out of Davos. Um, something is going to come down the pike, perhaps a political agreement um, within the next week and a half or so uh, by the February 2nd deadline, we hope, um, of the Article 29 Working Party meeting. Um, more into the weeds on the agreement, um, one of the things that we think is positive and I think sort of responds to what Meg was saying about um, this balance constantly being shifting as time goes on um, is the sort of the, the process of revisiting adequacy decisions by the commission over the net and, and the safe harbor over a number of years. I think that's, that's something that is largely um, both parties are both sides are comfortable with. Um, I think companies would prefer to have you know one agreement hashed out that'll last for the next twenty years. But uh, we understand. I think that uh, things on the ground change a lot, and um, you know the fact that this is a process is something that we can understand. Okay. Any any last questions or concluding remarks from the panel? Anybody? Okay. Um, Thank you to our panelists for this interesting discussion. I promised him that I would be responsible for some housekeeping at the end of the session. So um, the schedule is changing a little bit. The 3.50 p.m. dynamic trends panel has been moved to 2.40 um, in room 709 across the hall. And in this room, also at 2.40, will be the International Perspectives Panel featuring um, Assistant Secretary Strickling. And then the Fireside Chat, which your program says is at 2.40, is at 3.40 um, in room 806, which is across the hall. Just across the hall. Okay.
and all now right. There's, there's coffee now. And now there's coffee. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>